How many times your spouse could be late and you think all these stories and it's just because he was in traffic or she was in traffic. We, we can go down these thoughts that drive our heartbeat up, they get our stomach racing, they get us upset, and it's nothing more than an untrue thought. And I wanna go through 10 of the success habits that I thought that are in my book that I think are the simplest. Some of them are just gonna be reminders. Some of you, most of you know everything I'm gonna share with you for these 10 top millionaire success habits. The book is Millionaire Success Habits, but they're the same success habits for any level of growth or next level of your life. So they'll make sense in any area. But I wanna go through them because it's so in my head. It's stuff that you already know, but sometimes we forget, and it's perfect after the little fifth, three minutes each of sharing why you guys are here. So I'm gonna burn through these quick. You ready? Yes. First one, clarity on your vision. And that's what you guys just did with Brendan, and I won't go deep on that because you spent time, but if you, every successful person I know knows where they're going. But if you, if you just did something in the next week, just for proof of concept, over the next week, ask five to 10 people what they don't want out of life, really quick. Just say, what don't you want? It will come out like a flow, like you can't stop. I don't want this job. I don't want, oh, I don't want Trump. Oh, I don't want Hillary. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. And let them get into this rhythm of sharing what they don't want and then interrupt them and simply say, well, what do, now, let me stop you for a second. What do you want out of life? Most will say, hmm, good question. Or I have to think about that. So most of us are walking around knowing exactly what we don't want and what do we do? We run right into it, right? You know, there's a, there's a great story um, I'm gonna share right now that Ethan, he always does these church groups and he's the head of the youth group. So he takes 20, 17 year old, 18 year old boys on this, on this uh, 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 whitewater rafting. And they get there and the guide's nervous because the rapids are all number fours. It rained a lot, the rapids were high. And it just gives me a, a, a really great analogy when he got done. The guide was so nervous, he made the kids test like three times in the first mile. And what he called it was the positive point. And the positive point was the, the, the guide said, I will never point at a tree. I'll never point at a rock. I'll never point at the bad rapids that we can't get. When I point, it's always going to be a positive point. I'm going to point where we need to paddle our asses off and get to so everything will be fine. So just know, you're never gonna see me point at anything wrong. I'm always gonna point where we need to go. And what a great lesson for life. We don't, we spend so much time trying to avoid the things we don't want, we run into them over and over again. So figure, when your vision, when you have a clarity of where you're going, when people say that they don't have time or they're overwhelmed or they're too busy or they get just, uh, there's too much complexity in their life, to me, that, you don't need a time management program. You need more clarity on where to, you're going so you know what to say no to. We live in a world filled with stuff coming at us every second. We got cell phones and text messages and, and we're, we're available every second. We have to learn to say no. And by doing, having your vision, you get the ability to learn what to say no to. And for me, and this is from Dan Sullivan, the R factor question, the easiest thing, what gave me the clarity, I wanna give you guys this right now, and again, some of you may have heard this before, but it's the easiest way for me to get my vision. Instead of looking forward, sometimes we have so much stuff going on in our lives, right? We got all the things, you guys all have your stuff. And it's kind of cloudy around us because we're going so fast trying to get stuff done. Some days we spend a whole day playing defense. Do you ever spend a whole day just waiting for shit emails to come in that you can put solve or stuff and come in your office and talk? Like It's defense, so we don't have time to look forward. So what really changed my life about seven or eight years ago on getting my clarity and my vision is let's pretend it's one year from today. You guys are back here. We're having a, re a family reunion. And instead of looking forward, pretend it's a year from now and you're looking back and it was the best year of your life ever. You're alive, your energy, you're vibrating. You feel amazing. You can't wait to wake up in the morning. What does that look like? Rather than picturing what your life could look like, Look backwards on what it does look like and let yourself feel it. When I do that, when I look backwards on the best year of my life, I know, I know what I want to look like in the mirror. I, I know what I, my relationship should look like. I know how much money I want coming into my bank account. I know how I want to feel with my courage, my confidence. I'm, it's just a simple way to do it. So get the clarity of working backwards. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so next one. Work on your strengths. I think the biggest lie that we've ever been told throughout the history of our childhood in the world is to work on our weaknesses. It's the biggest lie. 
Because when you work on your weaknesses, what does it do? It makes you feel inferior, makes you feel, uh, you know, you lose your confidence, you don't have faith in yourself, and then all of a sudden we label ourselves by the things we suck at, rather than getting great at what we're already good at. I'm only good at a, f I'm only great at a few things. I'm bad at everything else. But when I learned that ability, so I'm gonna give you two quick stories here. When I was, when I was going through school, I had dyslexia. I mean, right now, I finished my book, it's done, and I'm trying to do the audio version. I can't even read my own book. <laughs> I am having so much, I'm on chapter three and a half out of 12, and I've been at it for two weeks. I literally can't read, it's just my brain goes quicker than my eyes, or my eyes go quicker than my brain, but I listen to a book every week. I listen to an audio book a week, but I can't, just the way I comprehend. But in school, I didn't know that I had the unique ability of, of being a visual and audible learner. I just thought I was dumb because I was in special reading and I couldn't, I couldn't get the words to make sense and sink in, right? So in school, I remember teachers making you feel inferior because I was weak in some area when you realize it's the biggest lie ever. And I'm gonna carry two stories real quick. So I wrote my first book, it was called Totally Fulfilled. And I wrote that book, I, I literally at that time only read a handful of books in my entire life. And I wrote Totally Fulfilled, I get done with it, I hire an editor, and she's highly recommended, I give her the book, she calls me two days later and she says, Dean, it's not a book, it's a 250 page conversation, you don't need an editor, you need a writer, because you're not one. And, and maybe she wasn't that rude, but it was pretty harsh. I felt like it was Mrs. Thompson in seventh grade telling me, just, just figure it out, just sound it out. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Um, so I, for two days, I go back to an old story. I start beating myself up. Why, why would you think you could write a book? That's not your qualifications. You could barely read. I go through all this stuff for 24, 48 hours. And then finally, luckily, I had a breakthrough. I'm like, the hell with it. I just have a message I want to share with the world. So I called her up and politely fired her. I remember it as just saying, no, thank you, and firing her. But I probably was more polite. So so I take the book back, I hire an editor, and I basically said, don't change my words, just make it so I don't look stupid. And uh, he cleaned it up, and that book was a New York Times bestseller in two weeks when it hit the, when it hit the air. I share that, I, thank you, I, and I, didn't, I don't share that to brag, I share that because that book almost didn't happen. If I would have stayed in that state of mind by thinking about my weaknesses, I would have not let that book go any further. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have had that evolution. That was my first, this is my sixth book coming out. I have multiple New York Times bestsellers now, but you realize those weaknesses hold us back. And I'm gonna tell one quick story about Ned Hollowell. Do you guys know who Ned Hollowell is? He's a, Oprah calls him the number one ADD doctor in the world. So Ned has been on Oprah seven, eight times. He's Harvard trained and a Harvard professor. And Ned, uh, my good buddy Joe Polish, who you'll meet today, introduces me to Ned. And I, I figured I have ADD because I'm always running around and, and energy's high. So I said, what's the quick definition of ADD? And how do you cure so many people? Why does Oprah call you the best? And here's what he said, something to think about for life. He said, you get Johnny is in a classroom and he's got ADD and his teacher wants to help him. She doesn't want to hurt him, but he's got to sit and read this book because Johnny's just not paying attention. So she makes Johnny stay in that chair until finally Johnny can't take it anymore. He gets up and runs around. Now Johnny's got ADHD, he's a hyper little dude. <laughs> so he said, what I know is when that teacher keeps telling him sit and read, sit and read, every time she says that, it chips away his confidence more. He feels inferior and he feels like he's got no hope. He said, all I do is I get together with Johnny's family, his friends, his teachers, and I find out what he's good at. And it could be math, it could be baseball, it could be anything. And we surround him and we help, I got goosebumps talking, we help Johnny get great at what he's good at. And his confidence starts to build. Because all I do is build their confidence by helping them get great at what they're good at. Because you fast forward six months, he wants to read the book because he feels better about himself. In life, we all, everybody in this room is carrying around something you think you're terrible at and you think it's a mark on who you are. We all can't be good at everything. Go after your passion, find out what you're good at and just get great at it. I'm not great at writing, but I can tell a hell of a story and there's writers who do that for a living that clean my stuff up. Get so good that you just pay for people to do the shit you can't do well. <laughs> That's success. So work on your strengths to hell with your weaknesses. Outside influences, filter outside influences. Think about this, I mean, when is the last time you watched the news and you got done and you were like, honey, listen to me, I know you missed the five o'clock news but they're gonna play at seven and you gotta catch the news because you'll feel amazing when you're done. <laughs> 
mean, watch the news right now. It's like, oh my God, but it's been that way, right? I mean, I think it was Time Magazine up until the 50s. The 90% of their covers were positive, and then they realized from the 50s to now, now it's 90% of the covers of Time Magazine and every magazine and every news organization. The more negative you are, the more viewers you get, the more books you sell. Uh, do you know online, negative headlines get a 60% higher click-through rate than positive ones? So if you think of the outside influences, when you're trying to be you're in personal development, you want to go to another level, you want to meet your full, maximize your full potential. When's the last time you watched the news and got done and said, I feel amazing, I'm going to go conquer the world? To me, that's just another outside influence that could chip away at who you're supposed to be, your best you. Take, especially the people in this room, I, I just, you, you have to be a filter of this because it'll just drive you in ways without realizing. The other one is, and we, again, everything I'm sharing, you guys know, this is a reminder service this morning. We'll go deeper later in the day, but the other thing is bad advice, right? We get our single friends telling us how to run our relationships, our broke friends telling us what to do with our finances, but we give them credit, and sometimes it's family members who are unqualified that think they're protecting you, but we take that. I mean, who in here has ever had a thought an idea or an invention that you wanted to get out to the world that you knew would help somebody. And then who in here had somebody say, nah, that's already been thought of. Oh, uh, you probably got to get a patent. Oh, get on TV. That takes too money. That's stupid. You're not going to get on TV. And just one of the things they said made you go, uh, maybe not. And then what happened two years later? Your stuff was on TV and someone else was making a boatload of money, right or wrong. But that happens in every area of our life, with relationships. But we allow that guidance. We allow that, even if you think you're strong, even just a little nugget of that can turn you in a direction where you go, well, maybe next week, maybe next year, you put it off and it's gone. Get advice from people who are doing it at a higher level. Take the advice, you know, you want to play tennis, play with someone who played at the highest level possible. Not your aunt, because she watches tennis on TV, right? <laughs> I tell this story really quick. This is a true story. My, one of my biggest infomercials was a, a book called uh, Be a Real Estate Millionaire. Sold over a million copies of that book. And I did a show. I don't know if anybody's ever remember it. It was a show I did direct to camera. It was one of the first infomercials where I didn't have a host. I didn't have fancy graphics. I just had a message I wanted to deliver. And I talked for a half hour straight direct to camera, no script. And let me tell you, I'm going to give you the backstory real quick. I was in Utah doing a small mastermind with about 15 people who spent a lot of money to spend a couple days with me. And as I'm going around the room with them, when I'm getting to them, I'm realizing why they're not going to the next level of life. It was all because of the advice of people in their lives. Some of the time it was their husband at home, their wife, their parents, their relatives. So I'm going around the room like the bad advice going on in their lives is crippling them. And I was, I was like, I was pissed. I'm like, I, I, need to, I need to solve this. So I called my team. Some of them are here. I'm like, I'm flying in from Utah. When I land, I want to shoot a new show. And we were, we were in the middle of building a new studio. The studio wasn't set up. So we just literally, they grabbed the bookshelf. They just stuck a whole bunch of books on it. I remember I had a sports jacket at the office. I had shorts on and flip-flops and a sports jacket. No one knew. I even put a tie on. I sit and I just rambled to the camera for a half hour. And I didn't make it a big fancy. I had my book in my hand. I said, oh, by the way, guys, if you want to get my book, call the number at the bottom of the screen. Then I'd go back to Sharon. But in this, the reason I'm telling the story is I'm so in the moment and not paying attention. You know when you're in flow and you barely know what's coming out of your mouth? I get to a point and I said, listen, you have to watch the outside influences and the bad advice. You have no idea how much it affects you. And you can't learn from people who don't know how to do it or failed. You think you can learn from someone who failed. They only know how to do it wrong. And then they're biased about it because they got hurt in the middle of it. So I'm telling this on TV and I say, take my parents, for example. They've been married nine times. When I want marriage advice, they are the last people I ask. They suck at it. <laughs> Completely forgot I said that. Didn't even know I said that. And then the show gets edited. We put it out. It was the biggest show I had ever done. It was running. Listen to this. There's no exaggeration. Every minute of every day, seven days a week for 18 months. It sold $150 million worth of books and courses. I'm not saying that for an applaud. I'm saying that because about three months in, it's on everywhere. Everybody's calling my parents. <laughs> So three months later, my mom, I, this is, I am not going to exaggerate this to a, not, even a nickel. I pick up, my mom calls, I'm like, hey mom, I'm in a great mood, my show's doing good, we're changing lives, my book's flying off the shelves. My mom just said, really? <laughs> and I said, oh, what's up mom? She said, really? I said, mom, hey, what's up? She says, do you know no one in my family knows I've been married five times until now? <laughs> 
she said, and her great, her aunt Dorothy, who she calls her aunt Dot, she said, Aunt Dot nearly had a heart attack. <laughs> it's her godmother. So I, I apologized, and I'm not kidding you, I bought her a brand new car the next day as an apology, and I've been buying her a new car every 18 months since then because of that. But that's how serious I am. The fact of the matter is my parents, it's like my parents when they were going through, they're both unhappy, my, my mom especially, not, not my dad, he, he just engaged and he just broke it off and he's 80. <laughs> Don't ask. I have no idea where this came from. Like, um, uh, but my parents, the way they were with marriages, it'd be like you get a new car, and you know when you're really excited, it's got the new car smell, you're excited about it. My parents were the type with marriages that they'd be in the car to be amazing, and they're going down the road, and they hit a pothole, and go, oh, I'm getting out. It's terrible. <laughs> Did you see that pothole? It was at least four inches deep. So that was my example. So, but, but do you think my, both my parents like to give me marriage advice? Of course they did. What was their reference point? Right? They were so, but I'm only, I'm only pushing so hard on that because everybody in this room is here because you want more growth, more personal. You already have filters up. You already are different than most of the people around you. You're already crazy for being here, for jumping on a plane and following the, the, the you know, you're drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, I get it. You're the different ones. <laughs> you get it. You're drinking the Kool-Aid, but... You have to realize that bad advice, those outside influences, you have to have a barrier so you can work on you. Next one, solution focused. You know, this is an easy one, but how many times in life when things go wrong do we spend too much time figuring, trying to figure out why it happened? We do. A relationship goes bad. We want to dig in. We have our egos take over. We get passionate. We get pissed. And how could that happen to me? And why would he do that? The nerve of him or the nerve of her or why did my partner take advantage of me? And we spent all this energy going in what direction? Backwards. The wrong way. And we don't realize that the quickest way to the next level is just to mourn it if you have to, be sad about it, but the fact of the matter is you can't go backwards. You can't undo the situation. You spill a glass of milk, you can figure out who spilt it, why it spilled, is it gonna stink, is it gonna create mold, or you just get a towel and a new glass of milk. <laughs> but we, don't, we take it more serious than that, and the thing is, if you're consciously aware of it, you will catch yourself focusing on why it happened, what went wrong. Yes, you wanna, you wanna think about it enough to prevent it from happening in the future, but then the rest is solutions. You know, I started this thing, I, I talk about my kids a lot. If you guys ever watch my weekly wisdoms, it's the greatest gift in my life is my kiddos. And I learned so much from them, they're seven and nine. I gotta break it down so simple for them to get it that it teaches me every time I try to give them a lesson or teach them. But literally with my kids, I started this about six months ago, and I'm not saying you guys are kids, but I do this now myself, even though I made it up on the, on a fl on the fly with my kids. But when something comes up and something goes wrong, I literally say, hey, let's grab a piece of paper. And I'm like, give me four things that could probably solve this. You know, I, I have baseball, I have this at the same time, and I forgot my homework. Like, how do we solve it? How do we solve it? I'm just trying to get them in this rhythm of understanding that the quickest way to fix this is to focus on the solutions. And not only do solutions help because you actually have a solution, it puts your mind in a different frame. You get to think where you could go, what you could learn from it, how you could solve this. And if you can make this automatic thinking, it's really this, and, and this, you can, we all suffer on a certain level, right? We all suffer, things we suffer with work, we suffer if the relationship isn't bad, we suffer if somebody didn't invite us someplace, we suffer if we felt left out, we suffer if our kids are hurting. Yeah, we're all gonna have that, but you could shorten that distance when you're disappointed or when you fail. The quicker you get to focusing on how to fix it is the length of your suffering. How many people do we know that had a really bad relationship and suffered for years focusing on what went wrong? Didn't get involved in the new relationship, had heartache, had pain. Finally, one day they got over it and said, I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna go back to the gym. I'm gonna start dating. I'm gonna go to match.com. It's like, you can decide how long that suffering is. There's no timeline. You don't, you know, sometimes we, we wear suffering and, and our stress and our anxiety, we wear it as a badge of honor. Because sometimes it does help drive you to another level, doesn't it? And then that's kind of a success trap. Like, I, I need to worry and stress and suffer to motivate. No, you, you really don't need to. You don't need to. I went years thinking you had to. You don't. 
You don't. Focus on a solution. Let someone else suffer. You don't need to. <laughs> Observer of your thoughts. So this is one. Who's read Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now? Is that a great book? So really, that's this. If you've ever read it's it's... The greatest thing that I continue to work on for me is to be the observer of my thoughts. When I feel off, when I feel stressed, I feel in a crappy mood, it's nothing more than my thoughts, right? Was it Earl Nightingale, one of the first one really pushing? We are just the sum of our thoughts. Thoughts are things, right? And it's the thoughts that give us our emotions. It's the thoughts that we think about as any given situation. It's not the situation. It's always our thought or our perception of that situation. Everybody in this room knows it, but everybody in this room, we all screw up and don't realize that it's our thoughts that can drive us insane. I, I'm gonna tell you a really quick story. I, again, it's gonna involve my kids. I get up, I get up, I, I make breakfast. I get up at five every morning, go to the gym, try to get back on time because I make breakfast every day. That's like our special time. We have this little family time, my wife, my two kids. We have this amazing morning. So, and of course, some, maybe there's too many mornings where I'm trying to give a lesson, but that's just what I do, right? <laughs> So my son has this amazing memory. I'm going to tell you the whole story. He's got this amazing memory. And my two kids are completely different, which is amazing. I get this, my son, I, he's, my daughter's like me. My son is more analytical, remembers things. But he loves, he's in this thing with these crayons that aren't just regular crayons. They're these fancy crayons with these long names like Rouge, La Love, something. And they're like all these crazy names. So we're sitting at the breakfast table and I pull out, it's a box of 50. I pull one out and he, and he names it. I'm like, oh, that's a, he got lucky. I went, long story short, I went through all 50. He knew all 50 names. I learned something about my son. This was a couple weeks ago. I'm like, wow, his that type of thinking. I couldn't remember five of them if I studied for three days. That's just not the way I think, right? So my daughter says, I could do that. I know she can't. She's me. <laughs> my, I, I, was the sh I am the fastest path to the end result. My son, you know, if you see a sidewalk that goes up and over, my son would walk up and over because you don't walk on the grass, you walk on the sidewalk. I'd cut across the grass. It's shorter. I'm not going to walk up. My son wouldn't walk off the grass. My daughter would take the shortcut. She wants to get there quicker. So long story short, she studies for a few minutes. She messes up on the first one. And I said, Bree, we all have unique abilities. God gives us, the universe, the world gives us all unique abilities. That's Brody's. That's his. You, you're always coming up with inventions. You're always the, the life of the party. So she gets sad, right? Because we gave Brody all this attention. And she goes, Dad, you spend, just out of the blue, she says, you spend more time with Brody in the mornings than me. Now, it's not true because I obsessively work on trying to stay with both of them. So, and I'm telling you this story for a reason because... I jumped on my daughter and I said, Brie, don't tell yourself and don't tell me a lie. Because if you tell yourself that lie, you'll believe it. And it's not true. I make it equal and I obsess on being equal. So I give her this lecture. She goes off to school sad. First time she goes off to school without giving me a kiss. And, I, and I'm like, okay. And I literally, she leaves and it hit me on what an ass I was. It doesn't matter what I believed at that moment, I observed my thoughts and I realized that was something I got from my dad. That's how he would have reacted to me. It didn't matter if it was equal. The truth didn't matter. Her perception at that moment was that I gave more time to Brody. And maybe that month I did because he just started baseball and I was doing baseball practice in the morning. That was her thought and I dismissed it. I basically told her, her thoughts were shit. Tuck them down. Dad says it's not true. Now go off to school. I got so, like, because I observed my thought. I didn't let that thought linger. I found out where it came from, why I was feeling that way. And I just had this rush of how wrong I was. I literally drove to her school, I'm not kidding you, 100 miles an hour. I drive to her school, I walk across her campus, I knock on the door, she's in like second period by the time I realize this. I'm like, hi teacher, can I borrow my daughter for a minute? And I just brought her out in the courtyard and apologized for being a shit. <laughs> and the, emo the look on her face, it bonded us in a way. We both left high five and hugging, kissing, because she felt bad, I felt bad. But the reason I'm telling you that story is because the only reason I caught that is because I'm trying to make myself stay in this mode of watching my thoughts. Your thoughts aren't real. Your thoughts aren't the truth. Do our thoughts lie to us sometimes? How many times your spouse could be late and you think all these stories and it's just because he was in traffic or she was in traffic. We, we can go down these thoughts that drive our heartbeat up. They get our stomach racing. They get us upset. And it's nothing more than an untrue thought. So try it a week at a time or a day at a time or an hour at a time. Just say, if I'm in a good mood, what is that thought that's putting me there? 
If I'm stressed, what is that thought that's putting me in stress? And then just ask, is it true? Or where did it come from? There's nothing worse than having a thought that wasn't yours. Someone embedded it when you were seven years old and it's still lingering, you know, you gotta kick that out. Okay, your past is research development. So sometimes our past can be the anchor that we're dragging across the desert or our past can be the wind behind our sail, right? Sometimes we did something in our past good and it empowers us, it gives us courage. And sometimes our past can be the thing that we messed up on that robs our courage, robs our confidence and we look back on it. And this is the, the best thing I've ever heard is pretend your past, pretend your past is an entire house and all the things that are on the shelves and all the little knickknacks and the house catches on fire and you have a suitcase and you can only take the parts of your past that are the most worthwhile to fit in the suitcase. Take what you can, let the rest burn down. We don't need most of our past. Our past doesn't predict, again, everything I'm sharing with you guys know, but sometimes all of us will have one part of our past that's that anchor that we're dragging, that messed relationship up, that messed business. The, 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 you were unfaithful in the relationship, you hurt somebody, you were hurt. We, just, we all have this, this, this mess of a past and you realize what if, you know, and this is, this is straight from Tony Robbins, it's one of the greatest quotes, it's what I think about literally on a daily basis is what if our life happened, right? If you know that, for us, not to us, right? Then all of this stuff in your past was supposed to be, all of it, 100% of it. I, I, you know, as a kid, I, I moved in with my dad when I was nine and I, I don't wanna go, I, I don't wanna, you know, make it like a, uh, talk about my past too much, but I moved in with my dad and we were homeless. We lived in a bathroom for six months. Literally, we, it was like the only place where there'd be heat. We'd drag an electric cord through the doorknob and plug in an electric heater. And then in the morning, we'd drag the, the mattress out and he'd shower. I'd wait outside, freeze, and he'd shower. You know, it was just, it was just a, some rough times. And I think about all that. I moved in with him because he couldn't handle the divorce he had with my mom still at that age. And he just used to freak out all the time. So I made a decision at nine, I could move in with him and I could help him not freak out so much. So I left my mom and my stepdad and this house that I loved and I moved into a damn bathroom. And I look at this and then he was a little crazy. Like he, would, he just couldn't control his anger. He was the youngest of 12. He was physically abused. He was sexually abused. And then his, my mom left him and he just had a lot of anger. And I was the only one that could quiet that anger. So I look back and a lot of my childhood, I'm like, man, I, I wish I didn't have to deal with that as a kid. I wish I was always, always managing dad. I mean, at 11 years old, I had a bleeding ulcer. I don't think I've ever said that, but I was come home from school and I'd puke blood because I was, my dad had me so nervous. But then I found a way to calm him. And I found a way to calm me. And, and just in the last 10 years of my life, I realized that was a gift from God. That's, that's why I can relate to people. It's why I hope that you, you guys feel understood. It's why when I write books, they sell millions of copies. Why I'm on stage, people engage. That was a gift. I was supposed to have that because I have empathy. I can, I can understand people's pain without them opening their mouth. I can feel an audience and know what they're going through and shift what I'm talking about based on that because I had to be so hypersensitive with my dad that if I didn't catch him before he derailed, man, and it was a week of a nightmare. So I could catch him, steer him back. And now he's in an amazing place. He, he's at my office every single day. He's doing, I mean, you know, he just, relationship didn't work out, but hey, that's what they do, you know? Um, but anyway, so when you think about that, think about some of those parts of your past that you thought, how could that happen to me? And rather saying, wow, that happened to me. And I'm still here. I'm at an event. I'm gaining knowledge. I'm growing every day. Do you know how many people should be here? Everybody, you know who's here? You. And you have that opportunity for growth. You have that opportunity for the next level because of all the stuff that happened, something drove you to here right now. Have an empowering story. Again, another thing we all know, but this is what I would just encourage you guys to do this week. When something doesn't go your way, when you feel something is too strong, when something is too hard, or you're disappointed, catch the first couple of thoughts that come to your mind. Because that usually is a disempowering story. Well, that's because my partner never steps up. That's because my husband doesn't support me. That's because I don't have a college education or I don't have the money to start my own business. When you hit a wall, it's usually that crappy story. It'll be the first thing you think about. And that's your subconscious telling you, that's okay. We didn't make this, but it wasn't your fault. The hell with that. Because the, the fact of the matter is, 
There's people who have been exactly what we've all been through and they've succeeded on a whole amazing level because of that. And I just encourage you to catch, again, I, I'm kind of going fast through these because I know so many of you know this, but there's little hacks in the things that I do to make sure I catch those stories and I call them out and I acknowledge them and go, that's just not true. It's just simply a story that's disempowering me. How do I just tweak it to make it an empowering story? Yeah, that my partner let me down. Well, you know what? Good for them. Hope they go on doing it. Wait till they see what I do. You could shift the story so quick to become empowering if you recognize it, but you have to recognize it. Passionate about what you do. You don't have to, I don't have to talk too much about that. But so many of us will stay in in something that is safe, and, and, I, and I'm not encouraging anyone to go out and quit their job, quit their life, quit, quit a relationship, but to not have passion in what you do can make life just be the same day over and over. I think it was Earl Nightingale that said, you know, you're in that hypnotic rhythm. You just found a groove that's okay, but you're not passionate about it. You know. I, I wrote in the opening story of my book, I wrote um, John Paul DiGiorio, Joe Polish's event last year. He started uh, Paul Mitchell and Patron Tequila. Um, but he said something that I realized that I had done, and I would encourage this with you guys, is he said one of his success habits was that even when he did jobs he hated, and he was bankrupt and broke and homeless with his son when he was... 20 years old, his wife left and handed him their two year old or 21 years old and left and he was homeless with his son and started the whole business with $700. People told him it would never amount to anything. He's, I think, 283rd on the richest men in the world worth $3 billion, the guy that had nothing. Um, but he said, even though he had jobs he hated, he knew there was a whole nother level for him. But he said, if I'm doing this job, I'm gonna do it with passion, I'm gonna love it because it's just a stepping stone to the next level. And when he said that, I realized when I was 18, I fixed 16, 17, 18, I fixed cars every day. I was a body man. I fixed wrecked cars. I'd paint under my nails. I'd breathe fumes every day. I hated it. I had headaches every day. Hated getting dirty. I knew it wasn't my life, but I did it. With, I, and he made me, I did it with passion. And when I look back, I did that with passion. And a guy that came in that f I fixed his car a couple times when I was going into real estate, one of the guys that came in, I fixed his car. He's always, you're always in a great mood. What are you up to? And he asked me one day, I said, well, I'm putting together these two pieces of property. I don't have a lot of money, but I'm juggling. I'm putting this deal together, this one, and I got this going over here. He's like, well, what if I lent you a hundred grand? He lent me my first hundred thousand dollars on one of my biggest deals ever. Would that ever happen if he saw how I really felt about being a body man? If I was like, oh, this sucks. Someday I'll do something real. Ah, that's how I felt. But I was like, hey, how you doing? So, there's two sides to this is you want to do something passionate, but be passionate until you do the thing that you're most passionate about. Because along that journey will be a strategic byproduct of what you're doing. You never know the next person that comes into your life, the next thing, the next opportunity. And listen, enthusiasm and passion outweigh intelligence every day of the week. Believe me, I'm a living example of that. My daughter's in fourth grade right now and she brings homework home and I'm like, hey, you should Google that because I have no idea. <laughs> fourth, I was thinking it was gonna be seventh, it's fourth. <laughs> Passion and enthusiasm, so, so remember that. Okay, model those achieving at a higher level. We know that's the secret to success, that's why you guys are here. You have the opportunity to learn from people playing at that higher level. We talked about it a little before. But just don't get stuck in getting the advice from somebody who's not living at the level you want. Everybody in this room has been told they were nuts or crazy or a dreamer. Congratulations. Congratulations. I mean, think about how many people out of high school when they have their passion or college and they have their passion and dream and everybody thinks they're steering them in the right direction by telling them to get responsible, grow up, take this, take this mundane swimming lane and stick with it, right? But the person advising us even if it's our parents, a lot of times don't, aren't happy with what they do. They're not happy with their job. They have no passion. Maybe no passion in the relationship, but they're showing us what to do. It doesn't matter what, again, the past is research and development, but now you guys are bright enough to be here, be in a place like this. If you're here, that means you're absorbing other great stuff from personal development to growth to how to make money. Just do it from the best. Find the people playing at the highest level possible and listen to them and don't let anybody knock you off track. 
And then the last thing, and this, you know, Brendan went over this, uh, and that's what you guys did that exercise on, is knowing your why. Why would you come to an event like this? Why would you, why would you travel across the country, buy a ticket, go through a course? So many of you have done high performance coaching. Why would you do all this stuff? And my life changed forever when I had a guy named Joe Stump. Uh, Joe, thank you, Joe. He introduced me to Joe Stump. We had this little mastermind outside my house. I paid him a bunch of money to spend a day on how to get my students more engaged. And he taught me this thing. Uh, some of you, my students know this, taught me this seven levels deep to find your why. And I just want to tell you, when he started with me, he made me go through the course with him. He made me go through the seven levels. And I'm going I'm to go really fast and tell you, um, because I want you guys to take this away with you. No matter what you think you're here for, on most, in most circumstances, it's two or three levels deeper. And when you uncover that, it gives you this driving force that the rest of these uh, success habits become easy because you know why. And I'm going to tell you, he said to me, why would you pay for me to come here to help your students? And what happens is when you first get asked, and some of you are more consciously evolved maybe than I was and, 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 and than I am right now. But I remember it comes from your head at first. And I remember saying, because I want to create a business that's strong, it's built on a solid foundation, and I want to change more people's lives. And, and the whole thing with the seven levels deep is you ask why with the previous question seven times. So he said to me, well, Dean, why is it important for you to change more lives and help more people? And I remember saying something like, I want to create a legacy. And, you know, there's a lot of amazing people in our industry. They've changed my life. And Brendan, is, including Brendan and so many, but there's other people in this business that, that shouldn't be in there. And I remember saying, I want to create a legacy and I want people in this industry to step up or step out. And I'm saying all these noble things coming from my head. And he asked me that seven times. When he got to about the fifth one, I don't even remember what else I said, but when I got to the, there was three more questions left and he asked me why. All that garbage went away and it came from my heart and I got emotional. When it goes from your head to your heart, everything changes. I get emotional and I remember saying, I don't want to go backwards. Didn't even, I never said those words out loud in my life. And he said, well, what do you mean you want to go backwards? I said, well, I live with my dad in a in a bathroom when I was a kid. I wore hand-me-downs. I didn't have lunch money some days. My parents always stressed about money. It was always the main focus in both houses, wherever I was, and had lots of houses. Wherever it was, it was always the focus. And I said, I, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to go to, I don't want to feel that way. So I don't want to go backwards. And then he said, well, Dean, I, you know, I thought I found my why. And he said, well, why is that important to you? Why don't you want to go backwards? And then I got emotional. I mean, I you can ask Joe when he's here. I started crying in front of my staff. There's about 10 of us there. I'm like, damn it. And uh, my kids came to my heart. And I'm like, I just want my kids to have choices. I didn't have, I felt so, had no choices as a kid. I want them to have choices. I don't want to raise two entitled brats. The world doesn't need any more of that. But I want them to be able to have choices. And I felt I found my why. It's my kids. And then Joe said to me, he's right in front of my face. He said, well, Dean, I think you've been working hard before your kids were born. So, but there's, we only did six questions. There's seven. Why is it important for you to give your kids choices? And I found my why. And it just came out of my mouth. And I said, I want to be in control. It was just it. I want to be in control, I'm not a control freak. What I realized as a kid, I moved 20 times by the time I was 19 with my parents, you know, ping ponging marriages, right? Step aunts, step brothers, step sisters, step grandparents, and you move. Then we go in a house and we get evicted and we move. I always felt out of control. I'd go to a school, find new friends, finally feel good. Come home one day, there's a moving truck. Like, shit, here we go again. I never felt in control. So what I realized, my why is, I don't want anybody to tell me how to live, where to live, how to dress, how to talk, what to say. This is me. I want to be in control and have no one tell me what to do because I felt so out of control as a kid. And when I had that why, I got it. I immediately know because here's the thing. When you hit a roadblock, which you will, when things go wrong, which they will, when, when everything you think is lined up and something falls apart, to think you want financial freedom or emotional freedom or you think you want to be a conscious being, that's all great stuff, but it's not enough to get you over the tough days because those tough days sometimes put us in our old course, right back. We get insecure, right? When we're rejected, Brendan talked about when we get rejected, when things go wrong, what happens? We feel like emotionally we want to run home, even if where home is isn't right. But when you know your true purpose on that deeper level, for me, when things go wrong, when I think I don't want to go backwards, I want to give my kids choices and I'm going to be in control, nothing can stop me. I'll, blow, I'll pound my head through a brick wall if I have to. Financial security, eh, it was good, but it's not that. So spend the time to dig deep. Whenever you thought, when I said, why are you here? Think about that. 
and ask yourself, why is that important to me? And when you think you found it, ask yourself again, why is that important to me? When you feel it shift from here to here is when you get goosebumps on your arms and you start getting emotional and you'll find your why. Think about that why, write it down, put it on a piece of paper when things aren't so great. Look at that, it'll drive you through. What's up, what's up? Hey, before you go, you need to watch these next few videos. They're absolute game changers. Hurry up and click right over here and watch them and I'll see you there.